I do think, though, that the biggest threat um, to to American support for Israel, to Israel's legitimacy in international institutions, and to I think to the to the success of the American Jewish community does come from the left. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello. And welcome to Top Story. Thank you for joining us. We have an interesting interview for you today about an important subject. But before we start, I want to encourage everyone to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. Now to today's program. What does it mean to be an American conservative? Liberal and leftist opponents of conservatives tend to characterize their conservative opponents as racist, reactionaries, and in a memorable phrase phrase used by former Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, deplorables. The assumption that everybody on the right is a political Neanderthal, if not a deplorable racist, does tend to dominate the liberal corporate media's discussion of conservatism. An example of that was seen in the last week when a story about threats being received by both Attorney General Merrick Garland and Florida Judge Bruce Reinhart due to the roles they played in the unprecedented raid on the Mar-a-Lago home of former President Donald Trump. Threats against public servants should always be considered beyond the pale, and even more so when, as in these incidents, some of them were anti-Semitic in nature. But the assumption that criticism of Garland or Reinhardt is essentially illegitimate or characterizing their actions as being politically motivated is something that only conspiracy mongers would do, which seems to be the Attorney General's point of view, is profoundly wrong. More than that, it seems to sum up so much of the discourse about the current state of conservatism. Granted, we are at a uniquely dangerous moment in American political history. The divide between liberals and conservatives has never seemed greater, and not just because they read, listen, and watch different media and social media helps us isolate ourselves from those with different political opinions. Those factors, and the fact that the mainstream corporate media companies profit from exacerbating the polarization of American society, are a huge problem. But the divide isn't solely the function of media or big tech manipulation. It's also caused by a fundamental debate going on in the United States about ideas, about who we are as a nation and as a society that is, in fact, far more important in the long run than the squabbles between politicians with a D or an R after their names. At a time when the left, and this includes the Biden administration, which is actively advancing ideas like critical race theory and intersectionality, as well as gender ideology in our schools and institutions throughout society, the stakes in the battle about ideas couldn't be higher. That is the context in which we must place not just the arguments about Democratic investigations of Trump and Republicans over the January 6th Capitol riot, as well as a host of other issues. If the point of the left is not so much to answer conservative arguments, but to characterize conservatism as itself not merely intellectually bankrupt, but as a threat to American democracy, then discourse, if not normal politics, altogether becomes impossible. That's why it's more important than ever for us to take a deep dive into the intellectual history of American conservatism, such as the one provided by Matthew Continenti's new book, the Right, the Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. In unraveling this complex story, Continenti makes clear that conservatism is not easily defined. It comprises a number of different schools of thought that have not always been compatible. Under the big tent of conservatism, figures such as William F. Buckley, the intellectual guiding light of the movement, coexisted uneasily with libertarians, those who focused only on fiscal matters, or those who were solely interested in hawkish foreign policy, 
traditional religious conservatives, so-called neoconservatives, who had abandoned the left because of its abandonment of classical liberalism, as well as paleoconservatives, who seemed at times to have inherited the xenophobia, isolationism, and anti-Semitism of European blood and soil right-wing conservatism. The assumption among many on the left is the claim that Donald Trump and the support he has retained on the right is a function of the collapse of conservatism. But one of the things we learn from Continenti's book is that the story of the right is one in which different tendencies have always contended for influence. Throughout the Cold War, they were held together by the common and ultimately successful struggle against communism. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, conservative fusionism no longer worked. Fast forwarding to the first decades of the 21st century, and you find conservatives deciding that the ruling class of the GOP, as Continenti aptly put it, acting as if the interests of working class and grassroots conservative voters on issues like trade, immigration, and the threat to traditional values were of no interest to them except as talking points to exploit at elections. And since Trump was in many ways, a uniquely successful president in terms of enacting conservative policy, the notion that his more populist approach to politics should be seen as wholly disconnected from the conservative ideas and leaders that preceded him, solely because his manners grated on the nerves of educated conservatism, conservatives and bred resentment among those whom he had displaced, seems to be less of an intellectual argument than an expression of snobbery. But no matter where you come down on the issue of where Trump stands in the history of conservatism, understanding the roots of these arguments and the path the conservatives took to this point in history is essential. And now to our interview. We're pleased to have with us today Matthew Continenti, the author of The Right, The Hundred-Year War for American Conservatism. He is the founding editor of the Washington Beacon and is now a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a columnist for Commentary Magazine. He is also the author of The Persecution of Sarah Palin and The K Street Gang. Matthew Continenti, welcome to Top Story. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Matt, we're really uh, thrilled that you're uh, with us today. Um, there's so much in your book that I'd like to talk about, as well as to ask you to provide some historical perspective on contemporary events and political controversies. Now, you begin your book by talking about 1150 17th Street in Washington and the conservative institutions it housed when you first entered it 19 years ago. Um, so much of what you call the quote-unquote conservative ruling class in that moment of American history in the salad days of uh, the George W. Bush administration is gone. I um, have to say, your description of that reminded me of historian Simon Shama's documentary about the history of Britain, in which he begins one episode by asking whatever happened to Catholic England, the uh, point being <laughs> assumptions about a place and ideas that seem dominant and almost unchallengeable can disappear pretty quickly if they are overtaken by events and other ideas that have greater appeal. And I think that's certainly true of the recent history of American conservatism, but also it's important because so many people tend to think that the status quo in an era when they felt comfortable, and in terms of this discussion, whether it was Cold War conservatism or the heady moment that you describe when people on the right were embarking on what would turn out to be a not altogether successful crusade for democracy abroad, Things change pretty fast, don't they? They do, um, and I think that's that's fair. I think the the uh, better way to think about it is things change. And so, you know, twenty yeah. years ago uh, is when I I entered this uh, movement, the conservative movement. I entered Washington journalism and politics. Twenty years is about a generation, you know. And um, if you even think about the changes in America and the world between. 1983 and 2003, the previous 20 years, those were uh, pretty remarkable as well. So I guess it shouldn't surprise us that things change uh, and change dramatically, um, but they, uh, they, they do. They nevertheless do surprise us. It may be something like um, the, uh, the proverbial frog in the pot of boiling water, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, if you turn up the heat little by little, the frog doesn't really know what's happening until the pot is is boiling and 
Maybe that's a fair metaphor for American society and politics today, actually. I think that works. Um, I also want to ask you, not so much why you wrote the book, but how you feel about some of the reviews that seem to want to characterize it as an explanation from how we got from Robert Taft, William F. Buckley, Ronald Reagan, and uh, Norm Bedard, among many other conservative writers, politicians, and thinkers, to Donald Trump as the focus of contemporary conservatism. Um, while that may be a simplification, I think if anything is clear, it is that you see his rise as, uh, to some extent, having its roots, roots in the conservative past. How important do you think it is for understand that the arguments that we've been having in the past few years not only about what is a conservative, but about how the different strands of conservative thought either contradict each other or work together are discussions that have been going on for 70 years, if not the last 100. That's right. No, I think that's one of the key uh, findings of the book for me anyway, is um, when I enter this product uh, project, as I describe in the introduction, it was kind of um, trying to figure out how the American right, how American politics reached the moment in in between 2012 and 2016, where it seemed to me that just a lot of things were were coming apart in that in that second Barack Obama administration. And so as I began to really study the history of the right in depth, uh, the first thing I found was that some of these arguments on the right we've been having uh, have been taking place for decades and decades. The, you know, the place of the Constitution, um, the relation of the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution, the relationship between populism and conservatism, um, the um, role that conservatives should play in the Republican Party. These are all things uh, that have been debated uh, for, for decades. Uh, the second thing I found was that Donald Trump is not that unusual a character in American history. I think there are many pr uh, precursors of uh, Trump's style, certainly of Trump's issue set. Uh, what really made him unique was uh, not only that he won the Republican nomination for president in 2016, but that he actually won the presidency as well. And that I think did change things in ways that um, I didn't anticipate uh, even really up until the final uh, year or so of his administration. So, um, so yes, I, I think that the, when we look at the history of the right, we see uh, recurring debates um, over the place of American conservatism in, in public life. And so another reason I wrote the book was that I wanted to just have a text that I could give my students uh, and that other people could give young people and say, look, well, you're coming into this story here's the previous hundred years of the story. And so I just wanted to kind of provide a foundation for people of historical and institutional knowledge uh, that they can then launch new debates or new versions of ongoing debates uh, from. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that this is one of the interesting things for me, and I think a lot of other, you know, of your readers, I think most contemporary conservatives tended to date the beginning of modern conservatism to Bill Buckley and the story of National Review and his famous manifesto about standing athwart history and yelling stop because it was Buckley who not only helped fuse different strands of conservative thought, but also helped put it on the map in terms of mainstream political culture at a time when conservatives per se were almost universally marginalized. Why do you think it's important to trace this history 100 years back to the 1920s and Calvin Coolidge <laughs> rather than to start it with the 50s and, and Buckley? Well, so uh, the reason I started to do this uh, uh, is, was for simple narrative purposes. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm a journalist before I'm anything else. I need to tell a story chronologically. And I think that one problem I've had uh, with other um, histories of the, the right that only begin in the post-war period, the post-World War II period, is we don't really get a sense of what those figures are reacting to. Right. Mm -hmm. What it is, what is it that they are trying to conserve? And so in order to relate to my reader what the motivations of some of these post-war conservatives were, I needed to talk about FDR and the New Deal. But then in order to suggest just how different, how in some ways radical FDR and the New Deal were to American conservatives, 
I needed to tell them, the readers, what came before FDR. <laughs> so that kind of got us to the 1920s. And so the 1920s is a period where the Republicans are in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, presidents like Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge, they don't consider themselves conservatives. Uh, they, they just can call themselves Americans. Americanism is what they stand for, or normalcy is what they stand for, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not until FDR in 1932 that people on the right begin to say, whoa, the Democratic Party, the progressive movement is going in a di direction we don't want. That's when they start to call themselves conservative in the 1930s. And what is it they're trying to conserve? Well, what they're trying to conserve is the pre-New Deal understanding of the Constitution, of the relationship between um, the federal government and the states, and also the federal government and the national economy. That earlier constitutional understanding, understanding of economics, is really what they're trying to conserve. Right. No, it's um, just, just go to, to, to go on for just one more point. Once I did that, once I found that I needed to begin the story in 1920 to show what people like Buckley really were talking about, I also found that there were similarities between the Republican Party of the 1920s and the Republican Party of the 2020s. Now, Calvin Coolidge and Donald Trump are not similar people, <laughs> very, very far from it. Yeah. Yet the uh, issues that the Republican parties they led uh, uh, talked about have something in common. And that, that ranges from a reluctance to intervene overseas to um, an anti-immigration stance uh, to um, a kind of uh, protectionist stance, or at least uh, trying to insulate America from global competition. Those three things are common between the period in the 20s and today. Mm. Now, you devote a, a chapter to the period when Senator Joseph McCarthy, the anti-communist witch hunter, dominated the discussion and conservatism and illustrate how a flawed and really dishonest messenger can derail a movement. And in no small measure, McCarthy's failures did help keep conservatism marginal for a while. Yours is an intellectual history and therefore principally focused on ideas, but it's also a story about individuals and leaders, too. Jumping forward a bit, is it fair to say that despite the fascinating debates, which you go into in wonderful detail, you know, it's a great read, among various thinkers will shape the views of the standard bearers of conservatism without the particular talents of specific people, like Bill Buckley and Ronald Reagan especially, as opposed to those important but less politically talented people like Barry Goldwater, the history of the last 50 years would be very different, wouldn't it? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think one big theme of the book is the importance of uh, individual leaders um, in the success of a movement. Um, it was uh, critical for the conservative movement coming out of World War II to have William F. Buckley Jr. as its standard bearer. Uh, he was able to... Um, present conservative arguments in a way that um, liberals uh, could not ignore uh, or dismiss out of hand. He was able to debate with liberals and with uh, radicals on the left uh, at, at the same level on his various platforms, including his television talk show, Firing Line. Um, and he was also kind of an aspirational figure for several generations of conservatives including my own, who saw in Buckley kind of a model of um, the engaged intellectual uh, man of letters, someone who uh, took ideas seriously, took words seriously, but also loved life, you know, and uh, went sailing and he had his, uh, his dinner parties and uh, he went skiing in Stad. Um, and he, of course, he had a sense of humor. That was that was crucial, you know. Not, and this is the same with Ronald Reagan, um, another leader uh, whose rise was not inevitable by any means, but who um, played a extremely consequential part in history. Uh, Reagan too had um, a, a sense of humor uh, that was disarming. Um, he had a uh, self presentation that was attractive. Uh, that brought in a lot of people who would not have thought himself, themselves as conservative or even as Republican. And he also had um, a, uh, a hopefulness about the future 
um, that that is often lacking in conservative leaders and in uh, also on conservative uh, intellectual uh, intellectuals. Um, conservatives, you know, we, we think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. So no, I think we, that's so true. I, I think most conservatives, <laughs> I always like to think of most conservatives have an inner Spengler, you know, right. the, the decline we're, we're of the of West. Pessimistic. And they yeah, always every... think, I mean, the people on the left think they're losing too at times, but right. yeah. people on the right guilty tend of to... This. <laughs> people on the right you know. tend to think that the world is coming to the end pretty easily. Right. Well, it's interesting about um, Reagan was uh, he rejected that idea. And, you know, in one of his final uh, speeches, I think it's his speech to the 1992 Republican Convention, he says, in America, we've always lived for the future, which is when you think about it, a pretty non-conservative sentiment. <laughs> and yet he was the greatest conservative president uh, of, of, of uh, the second half of the 20th century. Um, so uh, I, I, think you're, I think you're right to, to pinpoint that, Jonathan, which is that um, the leadership of a movement matters just as much, if not more, than what that movement stands for. Right. Um, I think a key element of the story of the various strands of conservatism is, and, and one that you, you focus on, is the ongoing battle on the right between more marginal extremists, like, for example, the John Birch Society, who have, at times, thankfully, been shown the door, uh, but which still simmer in the background and always pop up in different shapes and forms. Um, of course, if you were writing a book titled The Left, you could have similar uh, narratives about battles between mainstream figures and extremists. But do you think there's a particular danger on the right that conservatives always need to worry about? I, I struggle a lot uh, with um, the question of uh, whether the right is more susceptible to conspiracy theory than the left is. I know that there are many, many left-wing conspiracy theories ranging from the JFK assassination to, you know, who, uh, CIA being behind the crack dens in the 1980s and such. Um, and then, of course, both the left and the right are susceptible to anti-Semitism, which is the ultimate conspiracy theory. So mm -hmm. conspiracy theory exists throughout uh, the political spectrum. Um, I do think, though, um, the right, because of its um, position as uh, outsiders, um, uh, because the right has been excluded from some of the most, you know, dominant cultural institutions in our country for some time, it may make it more open to thinking that, you know, there's some hidden hand at work, that, um, that everybody is behind the scenes working against you. Um, uh, uh, but again, I, I, you see examples of that on the left. Um, uh, so when I look at the right, um, I, I think the thing to be most wary of is conspiracy theory. And that's something you see in the John Birch Society, and it carries on to, until, uh, through today. Yeah, I think you've been very clear about the danger of conservatives being dragged down a conspiratorial rabbit hole by populists. And I think that's very true, but part of the problem that a lot of what is dismissed sometimes quite rightly as conspiratorial thinking is also about genuine issues that we ought to be worried about today. It's, you know, the way the New York Times 1619 Project is taking over the t teaching of American history and critical race theory, mm -hmm. becoming normative uh, throughout society, including the government in the last year, year and a half <laughs> in the form of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that are you know, antithetical to equality and classical liberal thought. The same can be said about concerns about the way a few internet companies don't just dominate discourse, but essentially own the public square and can censor people ideas or stories they don't like. Those mm -hmm. aren't conspiracy theories and are in fact, in my opinions, in many ways far more important to the future of this country than which politicians and parties win elections. And yet conservatives mm -hmm. who try to focus and mobilize on these issues really right now are often put down by established institutions as conspiracy mongers. So how do we have intelligent discourse about such issues when half the country is essentially, you know, sort of gaslighting about there being nothing to see, you know, and coming after Russian collusion and, you know, the whole Hunter Biden corruption stories were silenced. Doesn't that sort of add to the sense among many conservatives that, uh, you know, sort of Michael Anton's famous article about the flight 19, you know, the flight 93 election was kind of correct. 
yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, I, I guess my basic criteria uh, for whether something is a conspiracy theory or not is whether there's empirical evidence to sustain <laughs> it. So uh, obviously, I don't think that criticism of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, or critical race theory is, is a conspiracy theory. I mean, it, it's these things are happening. They're political. They're live. Um, and I share the same position on them uh, as you do. Um, the, the internet censorship, the big tech companies, um, again, it's happening. There's no debate whether it's happening. Uh, um, there are serious public policy questions about what to do about it. And there I'm not sure even what I where I fall, in all honesty, on some of those questions. So are most people. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, there are other people, though, who are just kind of going, it's time to smash them up, or it's time to say mm -hmm. that every every form of speech is allowed. And uh, in all honesty, I don't think that's the right thing either. We saw in Texas what happened when the, the, the state legislature tried to force the companies to do that, and all of a sudden these platforms are filled with awful uh, uh, anti-Semites anti -Semites and racists and, 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 and worse, you know. Um, so uh, so there has to be empirical evidence. I mean, that's basically my criteria for what is a conspiracy a theory or not. Now, you're right. Um, the typical thing for liberals to say in reaction to a conservative charge is, oh, you just, you don't know what you're talking about, right? You're making it up, right? Um, for there, I think conservatives just need to be confident in their facts, in their case, and uh, not undone, not be intimidated by what liberals say. The, the worst thing for the conservatives to do, in my view, would be to say in response to liberal gaslighting, well, fine, then we don't believe in anything. And uh, we'll, we're going to start talking about how the lizard people are behind the voting machines in 2020, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That, that to me, is where you have to draw the line. Um, and I do think that, finally, one of the strengths of American conservative thought in the 20th century was that the facts were on its side and that you had figures like Milton Friedman who could explain stagflation and say, look, this is a monetary problem. Here's what we need to do to fix it. You had figures like James Q. Wilson who said, look, the broken windows theory Crime is rising because we're not even enforcing the basic necessities of public order. And then you had a generations of social scientists, including Charles Murray, who are saying, look at our welfare system. It's not achieving the desired results. In fact, it's making things worse. So uh, the type of conservatism I espouse is one that is based on empirical fact. And I do think that conservatives have always started from a place of reality. You know, let's face reality here. Mm -hmm. um, and that means accepting evidence. Yeah. Um, for many people on the left, there is a general and I think intellectually incoherent assumption that anti-Semitism, which we referenced before, is an integral aspect of conservatism. Obviously, there is a tradition of Jew hatred on the far right, but also one on the left. And also a powerful tradition of philo-Semitism, as well as support for Israel on the political right, especially among evangelicals. How do we square the fact that much of the country, including the majority of Jews, simply assume that conservatives are largely anti-Semitic when the populist strain on the right that is identified with Trump, that has assumed control of the Republican Party, is a populism that, while it may have a lot in common with Pat Buchanan's movement in the 1990s, which you discuss in your book, but it's also... In contrast with Buchananism, fervently supportive of Israel and by no means anti-Semitic, how how does that come about that we're having still having this sort of discussion? Um, well, uh, part of it is um, the importance of Trump, which is that Trump, I think, very cannily recognized that he would not win the Republican nomination if he were not pro-Israel, mm -hmm. uh, and of course he has Jewish grandchildren. His his daughter is Jewish. Um, and so he has that connection to the Jewish people as well. And that mattered quite a bit. Trump had a, it, it was more the party bringing Trump along, I think, in a lot of ways than it was Trump moving the party, right? And as you, the, to your point, uh, the evangelical Christian community has been the bulwark of support for Israel in this, in this country for about 40 years. Yeah. Um, I do think that there are pockets on the right um, uh, on the fringes uh, that are that are anti-Semitic and hostile to the Jewish people. Um, 
some of them are even weirdly pro-Zionist because they think that's where the Jews should go, right? <laughs> uh, which does not make them friends to the American Jewish community. Which is kind of a throwback to sort of European pre-World right. War II. Right, yeah, uh, exactly. Some, you know, the, the government of Poland, for example. Yes, but I do think, though, that the biggest threat um, to to American support for Israel, to Israel's legitimacy in international institutions, and to, I think, to the to the success of the American Jewish community does come from the left um, today and not from the right. There are parts of the right, as I said, that are threatening, but not to what you, to, to incorporate your point, not the institutions of the right have not embraced that. Whereas if you look at the left and you look at its, uh, its woke turn, um, I do think some of these institutions have embraced positions that are virulently anti-Zionist uh, and also when you consider um, the the woke turn, also harmful to, to Jewish success in America. Um, so uh, I, I do consider that the left to be the primary threat today. Yeah, I think, it, you know, sort of it's an interesting contrast. I mean, obviously you focus, you know, your, your, yours is an intellectual history of the right. But, you know, sort of at the same time that that strand of conservatism, you know, became dominant from as much as Robert Robert Taft is is kind of an interesting figure in your book. I, I learned a lot about him from your book. Um, there's a lot to learn in your book about a lot of things. Um, but, you know, sort of the two parties kind of changed identity, flipped identities in the last 50, mm -hmm. 60 years on issues like Israel. And... Um, Part of it is the interplay between the two sides, but it's also like an integral change, isn't it? Yeah, you well, know, I mean, it, uh, it's a huge story. It's a book in itself. Uh, Walter Russell Mead actually has a, a very good book out just now on um, yeah, who he was our guest last week. Yeah, yeah well, I see. Yeah, um, one thing I learned uh, from Walter, uh, and then I learned additional facts that are not in my book, is that Robert Taft, despite being uh, an opponent of the NATO treaty and despite opposing American entry into World War II and having a pretty, you know, what we would call today an America first foreign policy, was a Zionist mm -hmm. and had actually deep connections to uh, the Jewish community in Cleveland. And um, and then I just learned, uh, listening to an interview with uh, Bibi Netanyahu, actually met with Ben Zion Netanyahu um, uh, who made the case to him for support for a Jewish state. So uh, Robert Taft is an interesting case. Um, he was uh, against the North Atlantic uh, Treaty. He was against NATO. He was against American entry into World War II. And yet he was a Zionist. He was an early supporter of Israel. Um, he was a, a critic of uh, FDR's uh, attempts to limit uh, Jewish migration to Palestine uh, during the war. Uh, or and to you know his attempts to restrict Jewish immigration to the United States as well. Um, so Taft was kind of an, an, a, a funny way, a preview of where the Republican Party would end up mm -hmm. uh, on the question of Israel. But I, it should be said, and I I, uh, I, I study this and get into it in, in the book. Uh, I think maybe just bare just on the surface, since it's not a book about Israel. But mm -hmm. um, the post-war conservative movement, the movement of uh, National Review, William F. Buckley Jr., uh, was generally skeptical of Israel. It was not necessarily the biggest ally of Israel. It's not really until uh, after uh, Vietnam, uh, when um, uh, the Republican Party kind of has to take on the, um, uh, the policy of containment against the Soviet Union, um, and and as these groups of evangelical Christians leave the Democratic Party for the Republican Party, uh, that the GOP, GOP becomes more pro-Israel. Yeah, I even, think, yeah, if I, yeah. you know, it's it's interesting because uh, your passage, I recall that passage in your book, and I, I think, sort of dating myself, is that the moment when Buckley started talking about Jewish concerns was when the Soviet Jewry movement became important. Right. And it seemed as if they were his allies in anti-communism. It was like, yeah. then he got it. Yeah. And I think that, so there just briefly, that I think the key moment was the 73 war, mm -hmm. um, the Yom Kippur war, where, you know, Nixon and Kissinger uh, do everything they can to to help Israel in that war. 
and um, we you for the American right that revealed how important a piece Israel had become on the Cold War chessboard, right? And so, um, and so that that was a, a, a kind of the point at which they really began defending it. And then, if, and then two, one of the fallouts of that war, of course, was the Arab oil embargo and um, and the great inflation that was unleashed as a result. And so the conservatives in America were very hostile to the Arabs uh, after that um, for, for hiking up and causing energy shortages, gas lines, the stagflation. Um, so that, I think, in the 70s was, was the real turn uh, in the American rights attitude toward Israel. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, interesting aspects of your book is the way you show us that a contemporary debate about whether common good conservatism that sort of eschews pure market capitalism in favor of policies that seek to ensure good outcomes for working class or poor Americans and families is actually quite an old argument, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. And I, I kind of deal quite a bit with this question um, because it was if, uh, kind of... Uh, a revelation for me going back into the archives, reading about the debates between William F. Buckley Jr. and um, his allies. And then uh, on the other side of the question was Buckley's brother-in-law, uh, Brent Bozell Jr., right. um, who in the 1960s basically was making the same argument that common good conservatives make today, the, the saying that the conservative movement goes wrong when it prioritizes freedom, um, that you know, to, according to the common good conservatives, virtue is the end of politics, not freedom. And we need to have virtue and uh, we need to, and therefore the state should be more and more involved in moral questions. Um, and uh, this is the same debate that's happening today on the right between those who want to take a, uh, a much more... Um, uh, 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 I want to say effulgent or kind of just a very a bolder approach in their in their uh, regulation of the economy and society, and then kind of the mainline conservative movement, if you will, which says no, uh, the conservatism in America has always been about preserving the tradition of liberty mm -hmm. that is unique to America, and that means that we need to continue to prioritize freedom as the ultimate political value. We recognize that virtue is something that we look to civil society to sustain, not necessarily the government and for sure not the federal government. Yeah, that, that leads me right into the next, you know, sort of conservative debate I wanted you to comment on, mm -hmm. because one of the hot debates on the right going on right now is between those who see themselves as uh, natcons or national conservatives and who wish to root American conservatives, conservatism in the ideas of thinkers like Edmund Burke, who prioritized the role that tradition and religion should play in society, as opposed to those who believe in a more libertarian view to some extent. I think that was capitalized, capsulized in the dust up between two people I think we both know, David French and Sarah Bamari, in mm -hmm. which the latter you know, claim that the more libertarian strain, which he tends to identify with the conservative establishment, is essentially disarming society in the face of radical forces that are seeking to destroy, destroy traditional values. And with the focus of that being the argument about whether conservatives should oppose drag queen story hours for children. And I think French, who, who basically said people should be allowed to do what, what they want to do, seemed to have the better of the argument in 2019 when it, when that tiff started. But I'll admit that today with gender ideology on the march in the schools and people like attorney Gen the Attorney General of Michigan saying that what we needed was a drag queen in every school, his belief that bad things won't, as Amari claims, drive out the good in the public square seems a lot weaker today than it did then. But even so, and I think this goes to the ultimate debate in your book, can a specifically American conservatism prosper if it is not rooted in the classical liberal belief in individual liberty as the, its primary value? I, I, I mean, I you have to ask David French about where he stands on these issues. Um, uh, you know, um, I mean, I would say that the, I don't think it's a uh, necessary um, consequence of individual liberty to have a drag queen in every school. I, I, the, the, 
the post-liberal group represented by Sorab Amari thinks that it is. Mm-hmm. It thinks that it's inevitable that once right. you embrace individual liberty, that you're going to go to gender ideology in the schools. I don't see it that. Um, I think that there's a tradition of liberty that needs to be defended against a progressive theory uh, uh, that we now call wokeism on one hand, and also kind of a, a illiberal post-truth uh, demagogy um, uh, on, on the other. Um, so uh, that's me. <laughs> the uh, I'd also just a slight correction, I'm, uh, um, and I know this gets in the weeds. I don't think Saurabh Amari would consider himself a national conservative. The national conservatives now are the group led by Yoram Hazoni right. and Christopher DeMuth and the, the Edmund Burke Foundation. And there was quite a split um, between some of these groups over the issue of uh, um, Ukraine in particular, yeah. where the national conservatives said that it was right for a nation like Ukraine to defend itself against an unprovoked assault by a foreign power. Whereas the, uh, I'll just say post-liberals w- represented by Amari, they want, they're kind of the peace now of the Ukraine war. They want peace now, right? They, um, and that was kind of a split. So they diverge. All of these, all of these different groups ha- are, are kind of arrayed against what has been the mainstream conservative position since the end of the Second World War which is a position of what was called fusionism. But what it may, basically means is that you can support political liberty and traditional values at the same time. That even though it might, might, might not make sense intellectually, it tends to work out in practice, right? And, and worked out in practice in America for much of our history. Now our problem is how do we get the balance right again? Um, and, uh, you know, I... I'd buy the book of anybody who has the answer to that question. Different people are working on it in different ways, but I don't think anyone has come up with the uh, the right solution yet. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And, you know, Saurabh, uh, you know, he, he spoke at the last NETCON conference. So, you know, you'd be sort of, he, they're yes, all in the yeah, same. And of course, that was before the Ukraine war. That was before right? Ukraine. So, and of yeah, course. I think Ukraine was a big deal. Oh, I, th- I think you're right. And I think mm. uh, conservatives, um, and I think many Americans are still kind of, as that goes on, and it's an issue that won't go away, it's not clear how the needle will move on it. I think most Absolutely. people agreed, you know, obviously Russia bad, Putin terrible, um, you know, but if if we're going to continue to spend, you know, huge amounts defending the yep. territorial integrity of, of Ukraine, um, that will create, that, that creates almost a different discussion. Um, it does. Um, rather than just, you know, the idea of nationalism, obviously, that, that's a big part of Yoram Mazzoni's, you know, sort of banner. Um, although there's other things associated with his Burkean, um, you know, thought, some of which personally I agree with and some of which I consider to be just a bridge too far, such as the idea mm-hmm. of basically establishing Christianity as, you know, as the national religion. Um and his idea, you know, and speaking is he, you know, he's an Orthodox Jew, but he says, well, Jews should still be okay with that because it's good for society. And my response is, well, I'm a conservative, but why would I ever accept, you know, the idea of being a tolerated minority rather than equal rights? So it's, you know, th- that's one yeah, of the. I, I believe that George strands. Washington, George Washington wrote a letter <laughs> to the Jews in Newport that makes exactly that point, Jonathan. And yeah. my general stance on all these questions is, I'm going to side with George Washington, not whatever the au courant intellectual theory happens to be. In fact, one of the things that makes us conservatives should be a suspicion of au courant intellectual theories mm-hmm. uh, because they tend not to work out in practice. Because if the conservative is for the true and tried in America, that means our tradition of of liberty, of, of constitutionalism, of the rule of law as represented by the greatest among us, people like George Washington Abraham Lincoln, and on through the, uh, the the 20th century. Yeah, and I think it's ironic also, although I, you know, I, I, I like Yoram. I had him on the podcast. We had a great conversation. And I agree with a lot of the questions that he's asking. And, and 
you know, that these are questions that need to be posed. But, you know, it's interesting to me that as much as he looks to the Federalists as the sort of beginning of, of American conservatism and sort of his heroes, the one the one place where he thinks they went wrong was not establishing religion. And um, I, I can't, you know, obviously I can't agree with that. It was working out for America pretty well. It's, yeah. it's something, something took a turn. I think, it, I, you know, there's the old joke, uh, that you know you can always tell what kind of conservative you are by how far you want to turn the clock back right mm -hmm. and you know there are some conservatives who want to turn it back to the 14th century there are some conservatives who want to turn it back to you know the the night uh, uh, before ni 1962 or so whatever uh, i've always considered myself the type of conservative who thinks that things went wrong beginning in 1968 Something happened in 1968 to the United States of America that we're still living out the consequences of, right? But, uh, you know, up until 1968, America was doing pretty well. So <laughs> I'm not willing to junk the, tr the constitutional traditions, the Federalists, the non the, you know, the Establishment and Free Exercise Clause. I mean, that's, they're of equal weight. And I, mm -hmm. one thing that I really like about the Supreme Court is that they're finally giving attention to the free exercise clause as much as the no establishment clause. Yeah, so, as much as that um, drives the left crazy. Um, yeah, well, I'm happy to drive the left crazy. I mean, that's that's why I'm still on the right. But mm -hmm. um, I do think that we have we have great reservoirs uh, in the American political tradition, the Declaration, the Constitution, the Federalist, uh, Lincoln, uh, that we can apply to today. And that, to me, is the essence of conservatism. Mm, I think that's very true. Um, I want to return to Trump. Um, and ask you, as a historian of conservative ideas, how much do you think the arguments about Trump within the right, about the way the conservative establishment resented losing control of the Republican Party, getting back to your, you know, 17th Street, you know, beginning of your book, because voters were tired of what they perceived as their failures or what they believed, um, rightly or wrongly, as the need for someone who would just fight just as hard as the left, rather than being gentlemanly losers who played by the rules that were stacked against them, um, you know, to the detriment to not only of the GOP, but of the interests of the uh, that conservative voters expected them to defend. Is it fair to characterize these arguments as being, as some do, a bit more about manners and snobbery than policy, since uh, sort of despite the claims that conservatives sold their souls to Trump, as, as you pointed out earlier, it was he who actually converted to conservatism and yes, even ardent Zionism in order to please conservative voters. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, and, and in fact, some of the most uh, sustained noble successes of his presidency were the ones that were the most in line with what I've called in this conversation mainline conservatism. I mean, the most notable being his transformation of the Supreme Court which is a goal of the American conservative movement since uh, since the middle of the 20th century. Um, a, f a couple things about Trump. I was, I've been thinking about this recently. A Trumpism started as a critique of the Republican and conservative establishments, right? Trump himself uh, at, the, at his core has not really changed all that much from that ad he took out in the New York Times in 1987 when he was first visiting New Hampshire and thinking about running for president. It was the same thing to then as now. America's being cheated. America is weak. Foreign trade is bad. And our foreign policy is um, not worth it. We're not getting, we're not getting a, a, the right deal, right? That's why as president, he was always insisting that uh, our allies pay us for the overseas military bases, right? To him, it's a, you know, to him, it's a real estate transaction, right? So that part of Trump hasn't changed. And he brought that to his critique of the Republican Party and conservative movement in 2016. And he also added a few other things. At that point on immigration, he had been moving, um, even before he be ran for president uh, in 2016, he had moved to a position of uh, high, major opposition to illegal immigration, the desire for the border wall. That's a critique of where the Republican Party was on uh, on the immigration issue, right? Um, uh, where after the 2012 election, the Republican Party autopsy said, no, no, we need to, we need to have comprehensive immigration reform with an amnesty if, if we want to succeed. So Trump was critiquing their position on immigration. Trump was critiquing the Paul Ryan 
entitlement agenda, which had been such a huge part of the Republican Party in Obama's uh, first term. He said, basically, that's a loser. It's a political loser. And um, he was he was right. Yeah, now, the, the country may pay for it. Mm -hmm. The country may ultimately, pay for it yeah. down the line, ultimately. But politically, he was right. So he was critiquing on immigration. He was critiquing on Social Security. He was critiquing on the war, the war in Iraq, right, where there had always been a long simmering discontent, I think, that you could see in the Ron Paul movement in 08, in 2012, in the Rand Paul um, phenomenon of Obama during the Obama years. But then it really came out to the open when Trump attacked um, the, the Iraq war in 2016. So that's a critique, the critique of where the Republican foreign policy was, right? Um, and then there was a critique of kind of just dynastic politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, this idea that, oh, we're going to put up Jeb Bush to go up against Hillary Clinton. It was just even, you know, for most people, it's kind of like, really, there's no one else. And so what does Trump do? He ends the Bush dynasty. He ends the Clinton dynasty. And we're speaking in the middle of August on a primary night, the night that he's going to end the Cheney dynasty as right. well. Mm -hmm. He's the dynasty killer. That's what he does, right? Mm -hmm. And because people wanted something new. So that's how I think Trumpism started and where Trump started from. What's And what gave that strength was it was a critique, right? He was actually exposing real weaknesses on the part of the Republican establishment. What we have now, six years later, is that the Republican establishment moved toward him. Mm -hmm. There's really no, they absorbed his critique, right? And so the question to me is, where does that leave Trump? Where does that leave Trumpism? And what, the, what it's meant, I think, operationally is that it's just more and more about him, loyalty to him. Mm. And that can take him far, I think, in the, com in, the, in the next two years, at least in the Republican Party. But I don't think it has the, the same um, intellectual power that his critique in 2016 had. And that's interesting. Um, and that's a good point. Um, just going, drilling a little further down in sort of the evaluation of Trump and putting him in, in the context of the history of, of this movement that he took over, I mean, and that he really, you know, won over. Um, uh, is it fair? I mean, do you think it's, it's you know, fair to characterize Trump, at least before he was distracted and derailed by the coronavirus pandemic, as a uniquely conservative president? Do you, do you think those who, who make that point are right? I do. I mean, I think that um, one of the major fears among the conservative establishment, among conservative intellectuals in 2015, 2016, was that he, was, he had no history of participation in the conservative movement prior mm -hmm. to when he was thinking about running for president um, in basically in Obama's second term. So there was an amount of distrust. Is he going to turn out to be like Nixon, someone who knows that he has to kind of court the conservatives, but at the end of the day is going to govern as a liberal? And domestically, that is certainly what Richard Nixon did. Right. Right. Well, Trump became president and we know what the record was. And the record was fairly, very conservative. I mean, he ended up he ended up doing a lot for the conservative cause. Oh, Whatever his motivations were, I mean, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But and I also think it had something to do with his um, management style, mm -hmm. which is very hands off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'll concentrate on the couple of things that are of interest to him. But if you're doing things that he thinks sound right, he'll let you do it. So you saw a lot of reforms um, put in place, especially on the foreign policy level through like Mike Pompeo, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once basically. he figured out how to get people in, in positions, right. Once he had actually, his right people, right, you know, who actually wanted to do what he wanted to do, exactly, what he wanted, right. And that opposed, slowed things down, as opposed to people who were there to stop him from doing what he wanted to do. Well, think and think about his Iran policy, mm -hmm. right? I mean, imagine if he had started with Pompeo at state as opposed to Tillerson, we would have gotten out of the deal much earlier, I right. think, and that meant that we would have had a much more leverage in Iran for longer. And we wouldn't be in the absurd position we're in today vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the Obama administration. So, yes, uh, I think in the key the key point here is the court appointments. Yeah. Um, I should, you know, I should say 
it is interesting. I mean, we talk about the conservative establishment and oh, what they were, they weren't playing by the rules or rather they were playing by the rules and that was a problem. I do want to point people to the Harriet Myers episode in 2005, mm -hmm. right? You know, we have this uh, vacancy on the Supreme Court. George W. Bush nominates his personal attorney, Harriet Myers. No one knows anything about her. Um, those, it was conservative intellectuals, many of whom are no longer even Republicans, right. who, stopped, who stopped that appointment, right, by criticizing the president's decision. They took a lot of heat from it for it. But the upshot was Bush dropped Myers and nominated Samuel Alito, who would go on to write the majority opinion in the Dobbs case, right. overruling Roe v. Wade, one of the most important cases in the history of the United States. So that that wasn't polite manners, right? And that was that was that yeah. was taking on saying you're not living up to conservative principles here. You should have a real originalist nominee. Um, that being said, Trump, to go back to more recent history, Trump was good on his promise to nominate judges who were f who the Federalist Society knew of and approved of, right? And that was especially the case with this three Supreme Court appointments. And um, I think there the uh, we're only beginning to see the consequences yeah. of that of that of that decision. Yeah, it's sort of our last question. Um, I I guess and I you know I, I'm I'm any book which tries to trace the history of a movement that goes up to the present day inevitably has to stop at some point when you you know sort of put down your you know you, you close the computer yeah. and then by the time it you know gets to print things have changed you know stuff happens. Um, sort of in the year or so, I guess, since you finished writing the book, um, sort of, um, I think, I, I think you, 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 I, it seemed to me that you were sort of saying that Trump was, was, you know, was done, or at least thought, he, you know, it was done. And it seems like he's, he's so not done right now, um, in yeah. part because of the way the left focused on him and sort of turned January 6th into their you know, whole substance convincing many conservatives that they weren't so much interested in him as they were interested in them. Um, and I guess I, I want to ask, you know, sort of where are we now? And I think also in terms of a lot of the conservatives who were so dominant, people who were important and, you know, on, in, set, on that, in that building in 17th Street, who have sort of drifted away from conservatism. Do you see sort of that movement eventually coalescing back into, in, into you know, sort of a, a future conservative, you know, whenever the post-Trump era begins or, you know, if it ever does, yeah. <laughs> um, right. you know, That's how do you, where do you see that going? I mean, obviously it's speculation, but I, I'm wondering mm -hmm. where you would, you would conclude your book now if you were finishing it today. Well, you know, as it, as it happens, Jonathan, uh, the paperback edition out next spring will have a new chapter. Great, and great. The, well, the chapter will be from Biden's inauguration through the midterm elections uh, coming up a few months from now. So we'll we'll cover all the developments over these last two years. I think you're right to point out that when I stopped writing, which would be in the January of 2021, is when I actually stopped writing. I mean, it, it takes a long time to produce, literally, physically produce books sure. of this length. Um, so there was quite a lead time. Um, I did think that January 6th, um, the second impeachment, the loss not only of the presidency, but of the Senate as a result of Trump's kind of desultory campaign uh, in the Georgia Senate elections uh, would mean that the post-Trump era would begin. That has not happened at all. Uh, he is the front runner for the 2024 nomination. Um, I still don't know if he's going to run, in all honesty, but... Really? He, <laughs> well... You know, he can it, read the he, same he, polls that you and I show, which really up until yes, the last week was showing there are him, some other, him winning. There are, there are some other... Not just a nomination, but winning head-to-head -head yeah. matchups with Biden. Uh, yeah, narrowly. Um, there, are some, there are some other circumstances, mainly his legal um, problems. And I will just point out that he has a very nice deal right now, which is that the Republican Party is paying for his legal expenses. And that would end should he become a candidate for president. Mm -hmm. So that's just something to think about with Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but I've always believed, let's assume that he does run. He's a, he, he acts like it. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd be the front runner for the Republican nomination. 
So that means that the Trump era hasn't ended yet. Right. And so all of the political configurations that have lasted through the Trump era to this point are likely to persist, uh, at least at least through when he leaves the stage. And I don't know when that's going to be. I will say that, you know, the last great populist leader, William Jennings Bryan, um, ran for uh, as the Democratic Party's nominee three times. So this might mean we've reduced one more Trump run uh, in 2020. Well, uh, unlike William Jennings Bryan and Henry Clay, uh, Trump has won at least once. So, you know, that is, he's yes, not a three time loser said, that's yet. A, as I make as I, as I say, he is unique among populist figures in America because he actually did become the president. Mm -hmm. uh, most haven't, but um, he's been nominated twice, um, and uh, he could well be nominated a third time. Right. Well, we'll see if he turns out to be Grover Cleveland. That would be in the the next book, I guess. But um, Matt, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and for discussing your really important book. It's a great read, um, as well as providing with some, us with some perspective on contemporary issues. We also want to thank our audience, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.